so it takes a minute. Okay, our recording and transcription have started, um, so you should be able to see both. Um, I'm not sure if it turns the transcription on automatically or not, but um, but it is recording for us. So welcome everyone to our round 21 kickoff meeting. Congratulations, we're so excited to have you join us. Um, if you're new to our grant, we love getting new people, getting more people involved in OER and affordable learning. Um, and if you're not, if you're a, a returning grantee, we also love seeing people continue with this work. So it's really awesome to have you guys here. Um, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Tiffany Tierina. Um, I have been with Affordable Learning Georgia for, uh, I guess it's been a little over two years now. Um, I'm the program manager and I do mostly the, most of these instructional design, um, professional development type stuff, um, while also uh, so co-coordinating the, um, the grant program. So a lot of the uh, documentation and training resources and things that you uh, have seen or are going to see um, have come, at least if it's new, it's come primarily from me. Um, there's some older stuff that didn't come from me, but, um, but yeah, so that's, I mean, that's what, what I do here. I got involved uh, with OER and with ALG a good while ago, though. I started actually doing grant projects just like you guys are. Um, my first one was in 2015. I think it was round three. And the textbook we made from that grant project is still going strong and being adopted all over the place. So it's really exciting. Um, and I started doing that at KSU. So I came from an institution just like you guys. Um, Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Jeff Millat. I'm the program director of Affordable Learning Georgia. Um, I've been with ALG since we were an unfunded uh, pilot team that was just trying to get something together in 2013. Uh, and we've been at it ever since. Uh, before then, I was a reference librarian for electronic resources and virtual services at Valdosta State University. So I've uh, been with the USG for quite a while, and it's uh, great to see uh, everybody here today in round 21. Uh, for me, that's kind of mind blowing uh, considering where we got started. Uh, so to get us started, we're actually going to start by leaving this PowerPoint that we just started and doing a screen share tour on our website just to show you some of the stuff that we have to offer and kind of introduce you to what ALG is. So I'm going to go ahead and stop presenting here and switch us over. It'll take me just a second to get us going. Okay, you should be seeing a Chrome window with the ALG website pulled up. And I can't see your chat, so I'm hoping that that's a yes. Um, so we are Affordable Learning Georgia. We are initiative of the University System of Georgia. And our primary goal is to lower the cost of education by way of lowering the cost of course materials in the USG. So um, all, all of our projects surround that goal. Um, so we have a few different things that we, that we run and try to do. Um, keeping in mind that affordability isn't the only goal either. We also want to uh, improve student success and, uh, and uh, I guess improve the use of the affordable materials, which is where the continuous improvement grants came from too. Um, it's sort of, extending the use and extending the projects that we've done um, by making them even better. Um, so we have a few on our homepage. We've got a few big buttons here for you um, and some other things on our, uh, you know, that are going on on this page too. So I'm just gonna show you around, uh, let you see sort of what's available and, uh, and then we can uh, maybe take a question or two if you have any um, before we jump into breakout rooms. So, on this first big button, we have our OER button. Um, 
and there's multiple ways actually to get to this page. You can also go here to, uh, oh, maybe that is the only place to, way to get to this page, but there's other ways to get to other things. Um, so OER, we have two repositories at ALG. Uh, one of them is older and one is newer. And we're sort of in transition with them. Uh, right now, most of our stuff is still hosted in Galileo Open Learning Materials. And we continue adding things to it. Um, but this is our older repository. Um, and it's where all of the older grant resources are. OpenALG, on the other hand, though, is newer. Uh, we started using it just before I came on the team. I think, what was it, probably a year before I came on. Um, and we have since been increasing use over time. Uh, so all the new stuff, new grants that come in, new final reports come in, um, those resources get put into OpenALG and then just linked to in Galileo Open Learning Materials. And the reason for that is that OpenALG serves itself a little better for interactive uh, resources. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make things, uh, I guess, ma make our resources a little bit more uh, interactive, higher quality, um, easier to use. Whereas Galileo Open Learning Materials is more of a, uh, like a document repository, but it also has other benefits too. So we, uh, we use that for uh, tracking and, and data and, and lots of uh, librarian terminology that I don't know. <laughs> so that's all Jeff. Um, but we use both of these, and you can find resources on both of these. We're also in a, a very slow process of moving all of the older stuff from Galileo Open Learning Materials also into OpenALG. And part of that initiative is also making the older stuff accessible because a lot of that stuff is not currently accessible we've got a lot of retroactive work to do we've got some other things going on that we're trying to uh trying to do to make that work but um i won't get into that i just realized my name is wrong here that's my old name if you previously knew me my name was tiffany reardon before um we also on our home page have the statistics research and report button um, and that is somewhere that you can find all kinds of data from us, um, final grant reports. We just released our 2021 final report summary where you can go and read and learn about all the things we learned from our uh, last year of final reports. And your stuff, your final reports will eventually make their way into one of these final report summaries. Um, you can also find some peer-reviewed research that we know about. Um, we try to link to uh, articles and things that our grantees get published based on their OER work. Um, so if you are a previous grantee or have already been doing OER work and have some articles that you want to share that we don't know about and aren't on this list, we definitely want to know about them so that we can share them too. But that's a great way to find them, some more research. And finally, the Affordable Materials Grant, which you guys have probably seen at least some of. Um, on the main AL, uh, Affordable Materials Grant page, I would get mixed up between saying ALG and AMG, but um, our grants used to be called transfer, uh, textbook transformation grants. Um, and just in the last like year and a half, um, we had did a big overhaul of the grant program. So if you've done previous ones, you'll have noticed that things look a little different now and are called different things now. Um, but we think that they've improved for the better. Um, but on this main page, you can find information from all of our past grant rounds. So if you, you can scroll all the way down to round one, and look at the, uh, if you look at the proposals, materials, and final reports page, that's where you would find all the stuff that came out of those, those grants, it's all the way back in 2015. And so you can look at any of these. We've also done some pilot programs um, that were a little bit less like the current, uh, a little bit less like the traditional grant programs that we've done um, that were like targeted. So if you're doing anything that fits into those categories, that might be a great place to look for resources. Um, 
But yeah, so you can look at any previous grant round. And as you can see, the, the number of links reduces as we get up. That's because we've improved some things. Um, so you can look at these, uh, learn about past grants, uh, maybe see if other institutions have done your same courses and see if they have uh, some lessons learned or tips that you can uh, pull from them. Um, and as you can see, this page is organized by grant round. So um, if you want to search by your course or subject matter, you can also come and click on this grant master list spreadsheet. Um, and that is updated up to round 20. Uh, I actually am working on getting it updated right now uh, for this for the current round. But um, that actually has every single grant that we have awarded um, and some basic information about them in there. So if you want to search for past projects that have done your same course um, or past projects at your institution, you can uh, open that up, do some sorting and searching, and uh, it'll tell you where to uh, tell you which round it was done in so that you can go and find out more information about it. So that is our affordable material grants page. Um, we're going to show you the uh, another page that's related to that a little bit later. Um, that, and I'll actually just kind of you at it real quick, the Grantee Information Center. You'll learn more um, about this page in a little bit, but that's a big important page for you guys to know about. A couple of other things that we offer regularly. Um, so we have under our events tab, we have the ALG Featured Speaker Series. Um, this series is uh, it's a webinar series where past grantees who have recently completed their projects um, so usually within the last year is uh, who is presenting these. Um, and they're just talking about their projects and how they went. Some uh, you know, great things that came out of them, challenges that they ran into, things like that. Um, and so you might come and search through here and maybe attend a couple of live ones. But we also have the archives of these presentations. So you can go and watch any of the recordings at any time and just learn about what they've done. We've got some really great projects here. Um, and these are usually invited. So um, what I typically do is at the end of every semester, when we're looking at final reports, I identify a few that I think would make uh, great projects and try to make it diverse on like subjects and type of project and you know uh, course levels and things like that so that we have a good mix. Um, and so, who knows, maybe you'll end up with an invitation at some point to present. So there's that. And then another thing that you have actually seen already is the accessibility page. Um, and this is where all of our accessibility resources are. This is actually OpenALG, um, which you have also seen at least a little bit, but um, you'll see more of as we continue uh, through this grant project. Um, the accessibility page is where you can find uh, documentation and resources to help you make sure that any resources you create are as accessible as we at ALG expect you to make them. So we want them to be reasonably ex accessible to the extent that, I guess, is reasonable to expect of uh, faculty, librarians, instructional designers. Um, we don't expect you to be full-on accessibility experts, um, but we want your resources to be accessible to a reasonable point. And so we provide you with the resources to do that. Um, we try to train you as much as possible um, and give you as much as we can to help. So there's that. Definitely make sure that you like bookmark this page because um, that's where all our good resources for accessibility are. Um, let's see, Jeff, is there anything else that we want to make sure that we show them on our website before we keep going? I think you've got it um, pretty well. Okay, cool. Um, you can show oh. uh, just the newsletter part um, up at the top here. Uh, uh, yes. There is a newsletter Please link. Better. So if you were not yet added to the newsletter, if you're not receiving that yet, um, just click on the ALG newsletter and click subscribe to newsletter and you'll be able to sign yourself up for it. 
This is regular ALG announcements. This is where you'd hear about things like another round of grants, uh, new OER that were just released, uh, featured speaker series presentations, which are free presentations by uh, very successful grantees who want to uh, share their experiences. Uh, all kinds of stuff comes out through the newsletter. We do that monthly. Yes. And then I'll also actually show you, um, if you go to About and then ALG Champions, um, you all have champions on your campuses for uh, ALG work. So we have a, most of you, I think uh, we may have a couple of open positions. Uh, I'm not actually 100% sure which institutions have open positions right now, but um, most campuses have a faculty champion, a librarian champion, and a design champion. Um, and the, the idea is to have that on the ground support for you from as many sides as we can make that happen. So come to this page, find your institution, find out who your champions are, because they'll be really great resources for you if you have questions about how this stuff works at your institution specifically. And a lot of the time, these champions are also offering things like professional development or different resources um, to help you as well. So it's good to know who they are and how to find them. With that said, I think we can go ahead and switch back to the PowerPoint if I can find Teams again. Maybe. Stop sharing. Did it stop? Jeff, you may have to pull up the presentation again. Actually, I oh. think I can. Maybe. Let's find out. Ah, got it. There's a U Rock GIF in the chat. It's making me laugh. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah, that's for Tammy Powell, <laughs> uh, one of our ALG champions. She's here today. <laughs> um, that is the KSU faculty champion and also one of my closest friends. Um, okay, so that is our introduction um, to ALG, and we actually have a break built in already for us. So if you want to take a break, get up, go get a snack or coffee or something um, and come back in like 15 minutes uh, we'll go ahead let's let's say 16 minutes because it is now 1 24 p.m um we'll come back at uh I'm, i don't have a brain today what would that be 1 40. <laughs> yep we'll come back at 1 40 p.m um and we'll get started back again we'll get a snack and coffee See you very soon, everybody. Yes. Hi, everyone. Wanted to make sure that I am not muting myself again. <laughs> All right, uh, so it is 2.30. So we're going to get started on talking about grant procedures. This is the paperwork part of the uh, kickoff. Like it's it's something where we walk through the necessary steps that have to happen in order for these projects to be funded. And that includes a, a lot of stuff, especially some signatures. So we'll go through it all. You may not remember all of this uh, by the end, but that's OK. If you have any questions, of course, feel free to contact us on this. All right, so funding for these grants is not uh, your typical federal or external grant. They are not stipends to a team to do a particular thing for a particular line item uh, stuff. Uh, this is an agreement with the institution that this work is going to happen and that these are the people who are on the team. Um, that funding covers your time uh, if you are able to do so. So for example, uh, ways that can be covered, you can cover release time. Uh, that means usually you're trying to get replacement coverage. Um, you can be covered through overload pay and that would be connected to your salary. Summer pay would be about the same thing. Um, hi hiring student assistants would be another way to cover someone's time. Um, professional development is another way um, that things are covered. 
I know at Kennesaw State, there's a lot more professional development funding than there is things like overload pay, uh, especially if you are 12 month faculty. Um, but also this doesn't just have to be travel to an in-person place. It can be registration for an online conference as well. Uh, it could cover, for example, registration for the uh, Open Education Conference coming up later this year. Uh, materials, so that can be, uh, th those can be hard to cover book kind of materials, or that can be like software that you need in order to uh, create particular things. Uh, also, computer hardware is another thing. Um, so we release funding 50% uh, at the beginning uh, to the institution and 50% upon submission of the final report. Now, the way that institutions cover this will vary. So why do we do it this way? Well, the big reason is that these are very big projects. Turnover can happen uh, as you're going along and uh, doing a, a a survey of the landscape of software that you might need or materials, things may change. You may go, well, we thought we were going to use X, but Y is going to work out a lot better. At that point, you don't have to get another signed approval from us to make a line item change. With the service level agreement, you just work with your institution on it and the budget just kind of shifts in that direction. Um, also, no cost extensions. So some of these projects, you may not spend all of the funds uh, from the project over the course of the time of the agreement. Um, with easy no cost extensions through SLAs, all that the uh, institution has to do is just reach out to us and ask if they if we approve and we just email them back that yes we do. Most of the time that is all that they need. And we would want you to use those remaining funds to make the project better. So let's say that you have 500 remaining. It is more preferable to us that you enhance that project with those with that remaining $500 than it is for you to send it back to us so that it stays in that fiscal year's budget. Um, as you know, fiscal year budgets are kind of weird. You have to kind of spend that money in that particular year. Uh, so we're not so concerned with it. Uh, we would rather that you take the work that is on your proposal, which becomes part of the service level agreement and enhance it in some way using the remaining funds. If you can't, then it gets sent back to us and that's pretty easy to do. Uh, your grant or business office just needs to reach out and we have very easy instructions for them to get it back. Uh, and this 50% to 50% disbursement ensures that the project can get started and that the project gets completed at the end. Um, every USG uh, grant uh, sort of initiative uses a 50 percent 50 percent structure when it comes to this stuff. They're not just putting stuff up front if it's these kinds of big projects. And of course uh, you you probably have already done this because we now ask for a form about this, but you do want to make sure that you coordinate with the business or grants office, whoever you're going to be contacting for all of this financial stuff. Um, Anything that has to do with uh, PeopleSoft or overload pay or summer pay, um, course releases, student compensation, external consultants, that stuff gets done at the institution. So your business and grants office, uh, they're going to be the ones that know how that works a lot better than me. Um, you know, we have some overall USG policies, but institutions are already going to be following those. They also are going to be following institutional policies, some of which we will not be aware of and often uh, change from time to time. So I may know how things went at uh, Middle Georgia State in 2016, but that doesn't necessarily mean I know how things happened in Macon in 2022. Uh, yeah, so getting in contact with uh, the business and grants office, making sure that you know who you need to get in contact with uh, if you ever have a question about that, those institutional processes, that's super important. So what do they need to know? Well, they especially need to know that this is not a stipend thing. This is not a federal grant. This is not coming from a non-governmental association. This is coming from the same organization that they are a part of through an agreement between two different parts of that organization. 
Um, so we do not cover things like indirect costs. We're in the same organization, so uh, you know we would not be then covering things to keep the lights on. That is other parts of the budget that have to do with things that are very much outside of Affordable Learning Georgia's control. That's the kind of thing that is considered indirect costs, so especially if you see a budget and it says facilities and administration or F and A, I have to be really careful not to say that too fast, um, then that stuff is what you would consider indirect costs. Direct costs are anything that directly funds the project. So that's materials, of course, but that's also your time. So if anything uh, from your salary is covered, then the fringes associated with that salary are also direct costs. A lot of people when they when they first work on any kind of grant, they think that fringes like taxes, health care, retirement, that kind of stuff are indirect costs because they're not direct salary, they're not direct materials. But those fringes are a part of paying salary. They are they are part and parcel with making that payment. Those are direct costs. So this will differ at every institution. It'll differ based on your position. Uh, it'll differ based on the policies associated with that position at the institution. Um, but just know that if fringes are being considered part of direct compensation or direct costs in a service level agreement, that's correct. That is part of paying any part of a salary. Um, so, you know, this is especially why we had you contact your grants or business office so they know who you are, they know about an ALG grant. Every single office has worked on an ALG grant before, but not everybody in those offices may have been the same people as last time, uh, especially in this era of turnover. Um, there may be some very new folks there. So getting to know you is that first step. If they have any questions about ALG grants that you're just not able to answer, please send them our way and we'll be able to help out with that. So what is a service level agreement? Well, I could walk through uh, screenshots of the actual agreements or scroll down on the document itself, but I don't think that that's as helpful as going through what you're going to see when you look at it. I mean, it's a Word document with sections of it that have information on them. What I want to do is explain each section so that you can take these slides later on when you see the service level agreement and you'd be like, oh, OK, so that's what this is. This is where I need to look. This part and it's, uh, you know, in every single document in the state. Different parts of it. So uh, section one, this is pretty important. Uh, this is all about making sure that the that the stuff on your proposal, that proposal which becomes the statement of work on the agreement, is going to get done. Um, two things that you really need to know about in this section are that, first of all, be sure to check your proposal, um, and because this is soon to be binding, this is soon to be something that is going to be signed off on. So make sure that the stuff that you wrote in your proposal, that there isn't a, a glaring error somewhere. We have tried to pick up on every single one of those, um, but there are a lot of applications. We uh, go through quite a few of them. We do revisions with quite a few of them. We are bound to miss something. So if you get your SLA and you see the attached proposal at the end and you're like, wait a minute, I typed this completely wrong. Let us know and we'll revise it before we start getting signatures. Uh, that's the easiest, quickest way to make a change. As soon as things get signed, it's a little difficult. Um, and if someone needs to leave the team, this is one of the cooler things about an SLA. The agreement is with the institution, so you can bring somebody new in. It's not like, oh no, that person's gone and therefore we are perpetually one person down. Um, if you can bring somebody else into the team, you can work with your institution on um, getting that person into that role, having them associated with that same budget. Uh, let us know uh, if you're doing a transformation grant, uh, put that in the semester status report. If you're doing a continuous improvement grant, just put it in the final report because semester status reports are not uh, required for continuous improvement grants, but it, it doesn't require 
uh, ALG approval to change a team member all the way in the middle of, of a project. Section two is pretty standard. There's starting and ending dates here. Uh, be sure to check uh, on your end date. The start date is going to be the same. The kickoff date, March 25th, that's when we say, OK, the projects are getting started now. Um, but fall 2022, if you put fall 2022 as your ending uh, semester, it'll be at the end of that semester, uh, kind of gratuitously at the end of that semester. So we try to make it as far at the end as possible to make sure that you've had some time to do your grading and stuff like that before you work on a final report. In fall, that's December 19th. Um, in spring uh, 2023, it's going to be May 15th, 2023. Now, section three, um, this is mostly about the same stuff that I just talked about on how funding works. And this is the stuff that was already in the request for proposals. Uh, you do want to make sure that you check the first line of it because that first line has your award amount. Um, be sure to check the second bullet point because again, that has your date and your final semester. Make sure that the date and the final semester are correct for your project. Section four is new. It is something that has arisen over the years because as we've gone through so many projects, we have encountered uh, you know, a rare situation where something went wrong. Um, someone just completely disappeared and the project didn't happen and everyone went, what the heck do we do? Um, some institutions will have procedures for this right off the bat. They'll have a big grants office. They know exactly which policies uh, are, are going to happen. Um, when I talk to folks about how can I make this stuff easier for your grants office, a few will speak up and say, well, first off, you have to have a grants office. So some institutions don't even have a grants office. They don't know what to do if something goes wrong. Therefore, this section is there to let them know what happens if something goes wrong. So here's what, to, what you need to know. If there's no way to fix uh, the project, like that person is gone, that person was leading the project, the rest of us cannot carry on, we can't replace anybody, um, then at that point uh, we have to really work out how much was done, make sure that the funding covers what was done um, and that we're not going to then pay extra for stuff that can't be done. Um, there's, but there's usually a way to fix it. Uh, we have enough flexibility within your institution and within our own deadlines to, to make sure that these projects get done. It's in our best interest that these are finished, not that these are exactly done at this particular point in time. Um, so absolutely, if anything goes wrong, let us know and uh, we can we can work that out. Now, when we talk about something going wrong, it's not like. Well, you know, we used to call this uh, English uh, 1102 and now we have a new numbering system and it's called English uh 11002 oh no no that that's not going to be a problem um the big problems are like <laughs> where did someone go oh my goodness uh that kind of thing if, if it happens be sure to let us know if the project can't proceed uh for some reason if, if something's really getting in the way absolutely let us know um, and if there is zero work done there was no way to fix it the usg can recover those funds that have uh, not been used to complete the work. So section four is absolutely not going to be for everybody's uh, project. It, it will not be applied to most of them. I wouldn't even say 1% of them. I would say lower than 1% of them, but it's in there to make sure that we all know that should something go wrong, there's a set of guidelines and be sure to contact us as soon as it happens. Now the rest of it, this is more standard USG stuff. So uh, section five is on just about every USG agreement. Um, it is a standard thing on every government agreement, I believe too. You can't ask for more money than was stated in the SLA. 
it can't suddenly come back and say, you know, we need 50,000 extra dollars in order to make this textbook. Work. You can't really do that in that project. Uh, you could apply for a continuous improvement grant to sustain uh, the use of OER to improve uh, the materials to create ancillary materials. That's really cool. If you've got a great proposal for that, that's excellent. But you can't just go back on this particular project and say we need to increase the grant funds by about $30,000. No, we can't do that. It's only the amount that's stated there. Um, and uh, number six, so let's say that this service level agreement right now it lines up with policies just fine. Let's say all of a sudden a state law comes in and interferes like suddenly the two clash. The state law goes over it. Um, the federal laws, if, if suddenly a federal law goes over something in our SLA, which probably will never happen, but who knows? the federal law then prevails. Um, just kind of a basic thing of we are not going to suddenly uh, judge dread ourselves and say we are the law. Uh, you know, <laughs> we are we are subordinate to those laws. Uh, so number seven, anti-discrimination clause, uh, making sure that we are not uh, in agreements with anyone who is structurally discriminating um, in, especially in hiring practices. Uh, number eight, uh, that this is a modifiable agreement, but we need agreement from both parties. This actually does come into play. So number eight is all about the fact that if we were going to change the terms of the agreement, and that is usually about timing, like let's say something uh, something goes wrong, something winds up taking longer than you thought. Uh, it's just absolutely not possible to get this stuff done on time and we, we need an extra semester to get everything done. That can happen, but we need to make sure uh, that there is an amendment in order to uh, change that time and to put the amendment in that changes that deadline. Uh, we need signatures from your institution and then we pass it over to our folks over at legal to get their signatures as well. We say that this is a zero cost amendment. All that happens is that the final report is due later and therefore the 50% at the end is also paid later. Um, that happens somewhat frequently, especially because of what happened in the past couple of years with COVID-19. Uh, projects got disrupted quite a bit and we wound up with quite a few delays. If those delays are over a month, um, yeah, we need to do some sort of amendment at that point. If it's just a little bit late, a week or so, we can work that out without having a bunch of signatures. But anything beyond 31 days, the maximum amount that a month could be, then we need uh, signatures on it and we'll just move it to the next semester at that point. So number eight, even though you don't need to check it for accuracy because it's always going to be the same, um, there, that is something that you do need to know, which is that the amendment process requires signatures. Um, and then nine, uh, oh, oops, uh, nine we kind of take for granted <laughs> that if people sign this, then they are saying that yes, both parties agree. Um, we're also saying that the contract needs to be completed in a timely manner. A lot of times you'll, you'll hear the term time is of the essence. It really is a quasi legal term. If you put it in a contract, it means, hey, let's get this signed. Um, how quickly that is depends because I believe uh, most of the contracts that go to legal services at the USG say that time is of the essence and they have to be signed in the order in which they appear. So how quickly depends, but uh, this is just the part that says we have signed it because we agree and we're trying to get this done uh, quickly as possible. OK, so that was the anatomy of an SLA. Every group, whether you're transformation or continuous improvement, if you're the project lead, you will see that service level agreement. So here's how the process works in real time. The first thing is that we're going to draft the SLAs. I'm already getting the data together for that. Um, we just kind of auto populate the forms uh, and it goes into a service level agreement for each project and then we attach the uh, proposal that you had sent in the most revised the most recent revised proposal. So a few have revised uh, proposals revised ones be based on the timeline, especially 
or your final semester, those should be that final copy. Um, so yeah, be sure to check your proposal to make sure that that is the most recent one. We are trying our best to make sure that it is. Um, we will then distribute those to the project leads, um, the applicants on uh, the uh, proposal process. And you'll have a limited time to just look over these and get back to us if there's any problems before we move on to step three. Step three is where we bring them over to the business and grants office to get them signed. Uh, so it used to be that we would give these to you and then we would say, OK, please get them to your business or grants office. The tough thing is that sometimes it's, it's just hard to get in contact with them. Sometimes it's hard to find who that is. We already know who that is, so it's much easier for us to do it. Um, we'll try to get those done through DocuSign. There are some institutions that do not use this DocuSign application. Um, it's because they have to attach their own forms onto it. If that's the case, we'll just send it over. They, they'll let us know. Um, they get the SLA signed on their side and then they'll send it back to us. Now, once they get it back to us, things get a little more complicated. So we receive the SLAs. We mark them as OK, here is the number of the project. It is institution signed. Here's the budget. We've got it all in the file name too, just to make sure that everybody knows. We then submit these to the business office. Um, that submission process then encumbers the funds for this whole thing, should it be signed. Um, so, uh, you know, the kind of working budget for ALG, at that point we are setting aside those funds for this particular SLA. Now the business office doesn't sign those forms. They have to send them over to legal and legal has their own system. So I can't just route it over through DocuSign and then figure out exactly where they are in the process. Um, it is business since it's illegal. I think they send it through email and we do not know at that point where it is in the queue for legal. Um, if we ask legal, most of the times what they say is that, well, contracts are signed in the order they arrive. If things are missing for a while and you're like, what? the heck is going on more? I would say more than a month. It would be the what the heck is going on zone. Um, let us know because at that point we'll reach out and see what happens. Most of the time it's just there's a backlog and they will sign it before the fiscal year ends and it'll be OK. But every so often uh, there is just something that didn't go through uh, and so they just didn't see it and at that point we'll expedite the process. Um, so after that we have a fully signed service level agreement. So we were sending that over to the business and grants office people. Um, we're letting you know as well as we send them over uh, and at that point payments are allowed to happen. So you know we have the funds in our system. We have what's called a purchase order number or a PO number that allows invoices to work. So um, what happens first is that your institution's business or grants office will send the first invoice for half the award amount. Now that is not an invoice from you personally. It's also not the expense report uh, from your budget software. Uh, I've seen you know big spreadsheets get submitted with every line item and stuff like that. Those actually can't be paid. Um, it has to be an official invoice from the institution. It'll be on letterhead. It has an invoice number. It has an invoice date and it has the exact amount that we owe, which is going to be half uh, the grant amount. Now some institutions wait until funds are spent and then they invoice us. That's OK. Um, it just depends on what they do. Um, then what we do because we can't just send you over a check We're, you know we're not that powerful there are separation of controls here um, we then send the invoice over to the accounts payable office the accounts payable office doesn't just automatically go all right here's the PO number we're just going to send it right over they really check to make sure that there's nothing duplicated there's nothing weird about the date there you know they want to make sure that this stuff is compliant with all of the rules and regulations of sending out a payment too so they take a little bit, um, you know, one to two weeks is usually the amount of time that they would take. 
Uh, again, if the invoice gets sent out and a payment never arrives, check on it with us. Uh, there could be something in the pipeline that just kind of went wrong and we'll get that fixed as soon as possible. Now, if everything works just fine, accounts payable will send the institution that payment. They're not sending a paper check or anything like that either. It goes through ACH, which is an electronic system. There are a certain amount of people in each institution who can receive those ACH payments. So if there's just one at your institution and that person went on vacation, it may wind up that it's kind of backlogged. There's another situation where the USG could say, all right, well, we have this service level agreement from ALG. We also have the STEM grants over here, and we also have the Chancellor's uh, Learning Scholars Awards, and we're going to send it all in one big payment. That can be very confusing because then everybody's looking for one payment with the exact amount on the invoice, and they're like, where the heck is it? Um, so at that point, if they're looking for it and they can't find it, have them contact us. Uh, we can get in co uh, contact with accounts payable. They can say exactly when the date was, exactly what the payment was. They can sort it out from there and it'll be fine. Um, so yeah, the, those are the possible things that could go wrong with invoicing. But usually we get the invoice, we send it to accounts payable, takes them one to two weeks, ACH payment arrives at the institution, they've got it. Oh, uh, hi, April. Thank you. Uh, so at the end of the grant project, the second invoice will be coming in. So that's after the final report is submitted for most of you. Uh, for some of you, you can submit the invoice with the final report. It depends on what the institution wants. Sometimes the institution wants your report as proof that it's all done. That works just fine for us as well, uh, but yeah. Oh, uh, Mary is sharing her stuff too. We're getting uh, some descriptions uh, of your projects still. That's wonderful. Just keep going along. Excellent. OK, so if you are on a transformation grant project, you have to submit a semester status report at the end of every semester. The deadlines are the same there. Uh, you'll find them on the grantees page uh, that Tiffany had shared before, and I will share it with you here as well. I'm just going to get the URL for you and paste it in. There it is. That is the grants info page. And that is where all of the deadlines are, including the semester status reports. Now you're only submitting a semester status report if it's not your final report semester. Uh, so this is just to check if you're on track. It's a Google form. Uh, it first asks, oh, what if your course is one semester? Do you still have to do a report both semesters? So what we are asking is for a semester status report on the project, uh, not a semester status report on the course that you have implemented. So you may be creating open materials for two semesters before it's implemented. You're reporting on the creation of those materials at that point. Um, not just on the, the course itself. Um, so that's that's why if you are in a transformation grant. Uh, yes, oh OK, uh, if we have materials that are needed to complete the grant, do we use the first half of the award or do we purchase materials needed for the grant prior to grant money being dispersed? You'll want to contact your institution about this one. And the reason why is because institutions treat service level agreements differently um, some of them will wait until funds are received before they can disperse any funds. Others can run a line of credit and then they get the funds and that's all fulfilled. It depends on the institution though, so you're really going to want to make sure uh, that you get in contact with the business and grants office about that because they're, they're going to be the ones that are in charge of those mechanics. Oh, yep, Tiffany says you can help answer. Oh, thank you, Tiffany. So yeah, uh, semester status report is a Google form. It asks you for basic information and then uh, it asks you some quick multiple choice and short questions. It's a, a pretty low maintenance report. We just want to make sure that everything is going OK, that you don't have any uh, very pressing questions that you haven't gotten through to us uh, just yet. 
This is also a place where you'd say, hey, our personnel changed. Uh, somebody else is coming in, somebody else is going out. So yeah, uh, we're asking about your information. Uh, are you overall on track? Uh, what phase of implementation are you in? Are you making the materials? Are you reviewing the materials? Um, are you collecting them? If you have a really big list of materials, you won't want to put it into a form like this. Uh, you can just send it over to us in a Word document. I will then make a link to that document, attach it to the spreadsheet. So yeah, you can just send it over through email if that's the case. You'll just say, we'll, we'll send it over. Um, and how how is your materials review going if that's what you're doing? Uh, how are your new materials if you're creating them? Uh, how's the course redesign going? Any other work? Catch all question. Um, any question, any changes in personnel, any big changes to impact? So let's say that the commercial textbook that uh, you were replacing suddenly uh, it skyrocketed by $100 or it dropped by $100. Let us know because our savings calculations will change at that point. Also, if the number of students that you're teaching drastically changes. Now, if it's a change where we're like, well, we thought we were going to be teaching uh, 203 students and instead we had 208, that's that's not a big deal. But if it's we thought we were teaching 203 students and now we're teaching 800, that's a lot. Uh, so be sure to tell us at that point. And then, of course, there's just any other questions just to make sure that everything's fine. Uh, Tiffany says we don't usually send out semester status report reminders, but if you don't get one, uh, if we don't get one from you, we'll let you know. But be sure to keep those deadlines in mind, especially if you're the project lead. Now, the final report, of course, is only submitted after the final semester of the project. Uh, Again, the templates, the deadlines, everything that you'll need to submit it, that's in the Grants Information Center page, that Grants Info page. Um, there is one final report for transformation grants and one for continuous improvement grants. Uh, for transformation, we're asking a lot more about course design and uh, the ways in which students were affected. For continuous improvement, we're asking a lot more about the processes uh, in order to create or revised materials. So um, let's just take a look at this here. To submit your final report, you're going to go to the Grants Information Center. Um, and then when, when you get there, yeah, you do have to have some things there before you submit the final report. The first one is the filled out Word document. Just like when you applied, you need to have the filled out Word document first. Same thing here. The Word document is really the bulk of the report. Um, then any data that you have, any um, research data that you wound up with, uh, you know, if it's like five different Excel files, just put them into one zip and it'll be fine. Um, if it's just one, great. Uh, syllabi. So if you have one course, then uh, it's fine. You can just submit the uh, Word document or the PDF and it's great. Uh, with multiple courses, you would definitely want to put all of those into one zip file. Now for syllabi, you do need to make sure that these are outlining how the materials are used in the course. So something like a course schedule or a course outline. Uh, let's say that you said you were adopting an OpenStax textbook. Well, that's great. OpenStax textbooks are like 22 chapters long. They can be up to, you know, or over a thousand pages. So we want to know, you know, for this unit, what are you using? Are you using this chapter, this chapter, links to them even better. Uh, if you're using multiple OER, you're uh, going, you know, we're going to use this video and this reading for this course, uh, for this uh, particular class, then the next class we're using this and this and they're different. Links to those are extremely helpful for other faculty as they look to see if they can do what you did and and replicate that success in the classroom, make things affordable there. Uh, so yeah, uh, for syllabi, we don't just want a, a list of guidelines from the institution uh, that that will not help anyone else uh, they, to know, you know, for example, KSU's attendance policies or something like that. Uh, we really want to know how your 
open and low cost materials, and no cost materials are used in that course. Now optional, you can have a photo of your team or class if you want those to be included so that we can use them in like promotional things. Hey, join us, uh, you know, apply for a textbook transformation grant, that kind of thing. You don't have to have those. You used, it used to be that they were um, required. Also, we all used to be in the same building at the same place at the same time, uh, but now things are quite different. Uh, so if you want to take a photo for your team in class for promotional purposes, you can, but that is optional. Um, if you have, okay, so I, I, ha I have a question in chat about, yeah, do we need to include the videos? And Tiffany said, yeah, most people will uh, upload those videos to YouTube. If you have big files, stuff that you can't send in, let's say one email or, uh, you know, a 50 megabyte size limit, something like that. Uh, yeah, just put them in a shared space, uh, a Dropbox, OneDrive, uh, Google Drive. Um, you can always, of course, upload your, your videos to a streaming player and then send us the streaming event links. Yeah. Um, and if you have the second invoice, you can totally send it over to us and that'll make things quicker. Um, if you don't have the second invoice, not a problem. Get it sent once the final report is submitted. Uh, again, that's up to your institution on how that works. Uh, if you're a continuous improvement project, you probably will not have uh, research data based on that. You may, that's cool, but if you don't have exactly how the revisions to the OER or the new ancillary materials have influenced student learning, it's not required. So you'll want your Word document, that's the final report for continuous improvement grants, uh, it asks slightly different things. Um, you'll also want to make sure that you have your materials ready to send. Uh, if they're linked in your final report Word document, great. We can just access them from there. Uh, if not, then you'll want to make sure that you have the links to submit on the final report submission form too. Now, let's say that all of your materials are pretty small, you can send them through the final report form, that's fine. Uh, if it doesn't work, yeah, make a Google folder, Dropbox folder, exactly what uh, Dr. Chen just asked about as well. You can also host them on your campus website. Just be aware that there are some sustainability issues with campus websites. Uh, if anyone has ever gone through an IT site migration before, you know what I'm talking about. They're like, yeah, we'll preserve everything. and It'll all be there and then suddenly it disappears or the links change. And so there there are some things with putting stuff on your campus website that you have to be aware of. Um, but if you can maintain that, then that's great. Uh, you can also just attach them in an email and we'll be able to share them that way too. Uh, we're going to host them after that. So the method in which you send it doesn't really matter so much as we get them. And with photos, uh, we definitely do not want squished together headshots. If you're going to send a photo, they're optional anyway. If you're able to get a cool team photo, that's great. Send it our way. Uh, if not, that's OK with us. So the upcoming reporting deadlines. We're not going to ask for a semester status report from our transformation grant teams on May 16th. We know what's happening on May 16th. You're just getting started. Um, but summer 2022, uh, the ends there is August 15th. Um, fall 2022 ends December 19th. Spring 2023 ends May 15th. So we're pretty much on there. It's you know just the same weekday. Just checking out something real quick. Oh yeah, be sure to get in touch with Tiffany if you're looking to put stuff into OpenALG, AKA Manifold in a really cool way. Um, Tiffany is super great at that. And yeah, uh, Tiffany says, as we're talking about sending materials, um, D2L course links are not going to work when you're sending stuff to us uh, to be shared with the wider uh, USG in the wider world. Um, nobody can get into D2L except for the students that are in that course at the time and you. Um, therefore, that stuff would not be open. Uh, so you want to make sure that you send it to us in a way that can be shared widely. 
Um, we can't access the D2L sites ourselves. I mean, even though we're all part of the same system, uh, we are not part of the same D2L instance for sure. Uh, but yeah, so it needs to be stored in some way, sent to us in some other open way that we can share. Thank you, Tiffany. Oh, yep, yeah, and uh, and yeah, Jean is talking with Tiffany about the format for her manual. Uh, her manual is really cool. Uh, Jean just did a presentation on it uh, in our featured speaker series. It's archived on the site. It's really neat. Oh, yeah, <laughs> missed connection. There we go. Uh, and of course, the reporting deadlines. If you're ever like, oh no, what, when is this due? Just like when students might go, oh no, when is my assignment due? And you tell them it's on the syllabus. Oh no, when is my report due? It's always on the Grants Information Center. It's absolutely always on the Grants Info page. Um, be sure to, if you are a project lead, be sure to bookmark that in your browser so that you can get to it later. Um, you'll, you'll be referring to it not only for the deadlines, but for all of the materials you'll need in submitting a final report. We will be adding you to the listserv uh, for ALG grantees. This is more an announcement listserv than it used to be. Um, the original creators of the ALG grantees listserv, who are not here anymore, um, thought that this would be another way that people discuss their projects. It never really turned into that. Um, so, and what wound up happening more often than not was that people were submitting, uh, you know, personal questions uh, and hitting reply all and then sending it to every grantee uh, from any ALG project. So now it's more used for us to get in contact with you, um, both about deadlines and about opportunities. So if, for example, there's a conference coming up with some really cool opportunities to share your work, uh, we might send that on the grantees listserv. Um, we also would probably share uh, when our featured speaker series is going on, because those are grantees who have already done a cool, successful project. It's great to hear about uh, those projects and how they went. And now, if you do have any personal questions, please send them uh, to me and to Tiffany. Uh, we'll be able to take it from there. Uh, we just didn't want those to be uh, more uh, over on the list itself. Yeah, we don't pester you with emails for sure, um, but be sure to keep the that listserv uh, in mind. Yeah, and ideally both of us, just in case one of us is out. Oh, let me just talk about one more thing. Um, in here, if we ever need to contact just one round, we don't have a listserv for just one round. We don't have round 21 listserv and then all the grantees. So if we need to just contact you, we'll put in brackets in the subject line R21. If we need just the transformation folks, R21 transformation or R21 CI for continuous improvement um, or all if we just want to get in contact with everybody or if there's nothing in the subject line, assume that that's just intended for everybody. Um, this will come up when, let's say, we introduce round 23 and we say welcome to all of our round 23 grantees in the grantees listserv. You read this and you go, wait a minute, I didn't apply for a round 23 grant. Am I suddenly on a project? What happened? And I'm like, no, 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 no. You're on round 21. You're just on this list. We're, we're introducing the round 23 grantees at that point. Hi, Paula. Um, I'm just going to post this right into chat. Oh, yep, Tiffany did too. You've got it twice. Um, so this is the URL. This is how to get to the Grants Info page. How you bookmark it depends on your browser. Um, that, yeah, you're just, sometimes it's called add to favorites. It depends. There's some copyright-ish uh, reasons why they might change their wording on a, whether or not you're on Firefox or Chrome or Edge or uh, if you're on a phone on Chrome, as opposed to a uh, PC on Chrome, as opposed to a Mac on Chrome, which is kind of weird. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, and if you click Affordable Materials Grants uh, on the home page, you see a big link right at the top of the list that says Grantee Information Center. If you click on that, you'll be able to get there too.
All right. So now I just want to open this up for questions. Uh, what's weird about all this is that there's an animation. OK, but yeah, uh, we really can't see. Uh, can't wait to see what happens next. Uh, I see a raised hand uh, from Dr. Wozni. Go right ahead. Hi, quick question for you. A practical thing talking about the uh, two different uh, stipend invoices. Am I correct in my understanding? We do our project, we create our um, our materials. Let's say it gets done in May. We tell our business office, they contact you, and that's the first payment. We implement it in the fall. We, uh, we poll our students. We determine whether it was effective or not. Uh, I give you the final report. We get the second invoice, the second payment in December. Is that correct? Almost. So we want to get started on that funding process earlier than that. So as soon as we get the service level agreements going, we're going to send them to everybody, make sure that you check it, uh, that everything's good. Um, then we're going to make sure that the institution signs it, that the USG signs it. And as soon as the USG signs it and we send it back to the institution, we're going to say we're ready for the first invoice. Now, some institutions will immediately invoice us for the amount that they need, that 50% of the grant immediately. Others won't. Others will say, we'll take care of the payments here and then we'll invoice you for them later. Which institution you're, uh, which, which flavor of payment you've got it depends on the institution at that point. But we would rather get the funding sent sooner rather than later. So we're not going to wait until you've created the materials for that first payment. Uh, you know, for example, some, some teams may need uh, equipment in order to do that. We wouldn't want you to get the stuff done and then get paid for the equipment if you're paying for the equipment directly, that that kind of thing. But but it's up to us to inform, let's, I assume, our business office or you to say we're done with the first half, we've got the materials, and so now it's acceptable to give us our stipends, the first half. So the first half is going to be at the beginning. Um, so if your institution says, let us know and then we'll pay you. That's kind of on them. What we really want is we're going to send the signed service level agreement that says this project's going to happen. Um, once it's all signed, we are ready for that first invoice because some institutions will need that payment as soon as possible in order to cover the very upfront costs. Um, at other places, it may work differently where they say, yeah, actually, we need you to do all of this and prove it, and then we'll send over the invoice. That's not uh, common, but it may happen. I would say be sure to get in contact with your business office to make sure that that's the case. I'll check. With, I'll check with another um, another group that did a similar project here at Dalton State and find out how they handled it. Yeah, I just want to add. Um, so there's sort of a, a confusion here between. The, the invoice for ALG sending the funding to your institution and your institution actually giving you your stipend. Those are two separate things. So the um, when, when they invoice us, when we send our money over, it's not going directly to you. It's going to your institution and then it's up to them and, and your policies there on how they actually get that funding to you. Um, so when we're talking about invoicing, we're talking about the institution saying, OK, this grant has started. We need the first half. And then uh, and then they do with it what they need to do. I hope that helps. The second one is pretty much exactly what you said, though. I mean, you would let the institution know that you submitted the final report. The institution would then request the second half of the funding. And then just like Tiffany said, uh, from there, the institution takes care of that part. Anyone else? OK, I gave just enough awkward silence to make sure. All right, uh, so thank you all for being here in person. Um, well, as in person as we possibly can be. 
Uh, it's really great to hear from you and, and see what you're going to do. I know introductions are, are kind of like, oh, really? We get to just talk about what our project is. But that's super important for everybody because you're not alone. A lot of you are just doing your first ever project. Uh, some of you have done this for years and you've got uh, you know, experience that you can share. So it's nice. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for being here. Um, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to contact us. We are going to be sending out the recording to this and the slides as soon as we can. Uh, processing takes a while. Like Tiffany said earlier, we're going to have to cut out the breaks uh, and that takes a little bit. Uh, the video software that lets us do that sometimes uh, hogs all of our resources. And takes forever just to output yeah. the video. <laughs> I will probably also cut out the uh, the breakout group because I believe only the transformation people got recorded anyway. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we'll we'll sort of shorten shorten the, the recording to just the presentation materials. Um, but quick before anyone leaves, um, if you have not completed the asynchronous training that you were supposed to complete before this meeting, please do that. Um, there's a lot of really important information in there. Uh, it gives you a good solid basic foundation in OER, accessibility, all the things that you need before you actually create stuff. Um, make sure that you go and complete that that training. It doesn't take too terribly long. I think probably a maximum of two hours. Um, so please do do that. Uh, we have a hand raised. Hi Tiffany, this is yes. Punar. I had a question about the certificate after the training. I completed it. I didn't get a certificate, but I am assuming you have. Um, so you're of me completing it. Like at yes. the end of the quiz, going through the training, completing the quiz. And then is there a certificate to document that the training is complete? Yeah, so you're, um, you should have gotten a certificate automatically. Um, if you did not receive one, send me an email and I can double check and tell it to reprocess. Um, yes, so make, sure you check, make sure you check your spam in your junk folders because sometimes okay. they can be <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a USG way of sending them. It needs to go through Gmail uh, because we're kind of uh, going along, hacking together the way that it all works. And Tiffany's done a heck of a job uh, getting that all functioning. So because of that, you will definitely want to check your spam or your junk mail because we all get so many bad spam emails from Gmail addresses. This is not one of them, so it's it's just kind of tough. It, they often will get stuck in there. But yeah, uh, if you do not have yours, let us know. There could be a couple of reasons. One, uh, maybe you filled it out, but you got a 70% instead of an 80% or higher. At that point, it's not considered complete yet. Another one is just it goes over to spam. Another one is the plugin just happened to not send it out. In which case, we'll just click reprocess on your completed thing. We can find it and it should then send it right over. Uh, if you completed the training within since March 2021, you don't have to redo it. Um, just uh, if you got the reminder email from me two days ago, um, just send me an email that says, Hey, I thought I already did this. Can you double check? And and I'll I'll double check for you. I did accidentally send that email to quite a few people who were not supposed to receive it. So um, I apologize for that. But just if you think you've already completed it, just just reply and let me know, and I'll double check. See another hand raised. If you didn't get a reminder, if you didn't get a reminder, then you're you're all set. Uh, you do not need to do anything with your certificate of completion. It is all for you. Um, some people like to include it in tenure and promotion materials and stuff like that. So just hold on to it. It's just proof that you did a training. Dr. Lee, did you have a question? It's not exactly questions, but I just found out that because that I had exactly the same question and I just found out that it's inside of my junk mail. Yeah, you're right. So yeah, that's what I just want to tell. She probably need to check junk mail uh, in a folder. Yeah, the, the beauty of having something run through a Gmail address sometimes. 
Yeah, I'll just give a little bit of context behind that. The reason we use do it that way, um, I found this really handy plugin for Google Forms that creates your certificate for you automatically so that I don't have to hand make them every time. Um, saves us a lot of time and also still let me create this like custom thing. So they look really nice, um, but but yes, uh, they're, they're, it's not perfect. So um, definitely check your junk and your spam and let us know if you did not receive it at all. Yeah, it all runs on a Google environment, so we can't change uh, where the email address is coming from. Because it all it all operates through that same account. Oh, uh, Tiffany, do you know what the subject of the certificate email would be? Um, not off the top of my head, but it might come from something called certify them. Um, or it could come from something that just says like affordable learning Georgia training or something like that. Uh, I, I'll, I'd have to double check. The plugin is called Certify M. Uh, Aaron shared that it is Certificate of Completion Affordable Materials Grants Kickoff Training. Yeah. I think we can probably go ahead and stop recording so that I have less to cut off. <laughs> yep, sounds good. But feel free to stay and keep asking questions if you have them. Thanks everybody. It's been a really great time as always. I get so nervous about uh, every kickoff that I go to and then as soon as I see everybody,